So thank you very much for staying. And um, I just wanted to start by thanking the college because the college um, gives to research. Uh, it gives $5,000 research awards and it gives to the Clinical Scholars Program. Um, and it's that sort of research that we're going to talk about, research that's embedded in primary care. We're going to whip through uh, six if we can get through them. Um, I have to do disclaimers first. And while we're doing that, uh, so Wendy, you're first. Ah, yes. So um, we uh, both have research that has had contributions from industry, but none of our research has ever been affected in its design or what we publish or what we have found out um, by any of the industry contributions. And, and you can see mine um, funded, and again, it doesn't affect the way I do these talks or, or anything else. Um, and there's a potential for conflict, and we don't. Well, we do, but... Not Potential, here. but it doesn't yeah. uh, manifest. But a conflict the between problem. the two of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell Diana if you. Oh, want. okay, all right. <laughs> so we're trying to prevent this, um, but because you haven't had your lunch, that it's likely not to happen. Nat Craig, I'm trying to change the name. North American Primary Care Research. Group. But the group actually likes the name. This is the trouble. Martin's oh. tried to change the name for years, but everybody wants to continue to call it NAP Craig. Right. We have a lot of people, and we have a lot of research. So this year it's going to be in Ottawa. Um, I can say that now properly with a Canadian accent, eh? <laughs> and um, it's going to be, we've got about 600 applications um, to present there. So it's pretty big. Um, so this is what we're going to go through, uh, the research question, what the researchers did, what they found, and the importance. So we're going to squeeze four years of work into four slides. So I'm going to do the first one, and then we're going to in, um, alternate. Can I say just something yes. before you go? So this is an ad for the Clinician Scholar Program at UBC. We have the facility to be able to help support people who are starting to ask questions in their own practices. And if that's you, we would love to hear from you because we can help protect some of your time. That is salary for you to be able to start these investigations, and we can mentor you to do that. Sorry, quick ad. No, 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 that's good. <laughs> So if this interests you, you yeah. there's more to If you want to do this sort of stuff, answer these sorts of questions, just ask Wendy. Um, uh, so, cough, really important. We see it all the time. How long does it last? How long do the patients think it lasts? So uh, this group, uh, they're not residents as in the residency training program. Um, it's Georgia, um, and they gave them vignettes of, of what, uh, of what a typical cough might look like. They asked them how long they thought it would last um, and their beliefs regarding the use of antibiotics. So it was a, a bit of a two-edged sword there. Um, and then they went to the world literature and said, well, how long does it last? Um, and not surprisingly, um, they found that people thought cough lasted a very short time compared to what it actually does last. Um, so does that number surprise you? I hope not. 17.8 um, days is, is the average length of a cough, um, and people think it's going to last less than a week, which is why they turn up to you saying, can I have an antibiotic, please? Um, there are some predictors there of, of, what of why, uh, what sorts of people thought that uh, cough would last a short time or their beliefs about antibiotics, um, which are not surprising. And it's really a, an edge there to think about education. Um, because if patients believe that acute bronchitis should last... Oh, and acute bronchitis is when we give an antibiotic. There is no such thing. It's when we decide to give an antibiotic, it becomes acute bronchitis. Um, uh, but they think that it should be, OK, less than a week. We'll come to the doctor. We expect an antibiotic. If we educate people about how long a cough might last, um, then maybe they'll come to your practice less often. And you could think about putting up a poster or doing something right now uh, to do that. Your turn. So do you think, Martin, that um, some of the people in British Columbia would have those same expectations? That cough, what do you guys think? Do people think cough should be a week or less? Yeah. 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 Well, now you can tell them. We know cough is 17.8 days. There's a, there's a rumor going around that there's a 100-day cough. So my, I love it. My patients come in, there's coughing. They say, I hear there's a 100-day cough. And I say, yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. <laughs> You heard it here first. So maybe, maybe we could be the ones to find the evidence on that. 
Um, so these, this next group was looking at uh, E. coli resistance and cystitis. Again, a really common question in your own practices, I'm sure. And as it turns out, they wanted to, they had done a study like this about uh, eight or ten years before, and they wanted to see what changes were happening in, uh, Brit in British Columbia and across uh, Canada. These were researchers out of Toronto. Um, have resistance rates risen? Are they at the 20% level of resistance where you no longer would use that drug? Um, and in what populations and what sorts, particularly looking now at the fluoroquinolones that had no resistance at all in their study about eight years ago. So they contacted, this is actually a little bit sad, don't you think, 15,000 physicians across the country, and they got 300 to participate. Um, so hopefully with practice-based research networks and our electronic medical records, we can have more of the primary care data come into analyses like this so that we can really find out what does and doesn't work in your own patients. Um, their design was cross-sectional across Canada, and they were comparing the urine culture results uh, for any positive urines and they they had a very detailed method which was excellent uh, I'd be happy to talk about that later uh, so what they did find is across Canada there was about 16% resistance to um, uh, trimethoprim uh, sulfamethoxazole and um, so this is lower than the 20% that we would need in order to stop using that for our E. coli cystitis but higher than the 10% that they'd found uh, back in 2002 However, they did find a subgroup where there were 21%. So the women under 50 had a higher level of resistance to this. And that was a significant difference. Um, I thought it was interesting. When you look back at the 2002 paper, it was the women over 50 who had more resistance at that stage. So why we're having a bit of a shift, uh, that's another research question that could be asked. Um, ciprofloxacin resistance is now starting to show up. And both of these are more common in British Columbia than anywhere else in Canada. So we need to look at our own practices and look at those results that you're getting back on your urines. Um, it may be that we need to be examining how much we're using uh, which antibiotics for this. Um, Nitrofurantone resistance very low across um, uh, the country for E. coli, but in other organisms it uh, was starting to show up. Does this? Yes, there we go. Great. Go on to mine. That's you. Okay, so uh, do you think this is a plan by sports medicine to rupture Achilles tendons then? All this Cipro? <laughs> Okay, the Cipro is maybe doesn't cause that many ruptured Achilles tendons. This is a more serious one. This is I guess it would depend actually how, uh, how much activity you'd be seeing in those women under 50 who are getting bladder infections. Yes. So there's a trial for someone to do. Um, so this is slightly more um, serious in terms of the fact that when someone comes in with a lung cancer and it's uh, a little more developed, um, basically, the survival is, is pretty awful. Um, so if we could get them a little bit earlier, uh, could we actually then treat them and improve survival? Um, because at the moment, we don't seem to be able to prevent a core of people smoking um, or doing other activities or their genetics or whatever it is that leads to their cancers. So we still see it around. Um, and unfortunately, when it does happen, it's often seen late. So this group thought, well, maybe we could ed educate the people at risk, um, basically heavy smokers, uh, to come in and uh, earlier if they had symptoms. So um, it was quite a nice one. It's done in Scotland, uh, in the UK. Uh, and um, what happened was they just took a practice nurse, and it was only an hour, so not a long one, a a very pragmatic, so you could actually do it in practice. Um, and an educational program delivered... Um, by the practice nurse to say, okay, you are at risk, um, and this is what you should do if you get a cough. Um, and it's a bit small there. Um, main outcomes were consultations, but also they then followed up at um, six months to see what the people thought. Uh, so what would they do if they've got um, a chest infection or a cough? Because it was only 200 people, I think, um, in the study. And obviously, if you're going to do this prospectively and look at a reduction in lung cancer, then you're probably going to need two million people, um, and that's beyond our budgets. But at least we could get some idea of whether it works. And, and it seems to. Um, so the consultation rate for new chest symptoms in the intervention group um, was uh, a little bit higher, well, 20% higher um, than those in usual care, and the proportion of consultations within the target time um, was 11% higher. Um, now, you see the significance there is not great um, because they're using small numbers of individuals. 
At the follow-up, though, with the education, um, the people who had been through the program knew what to do. So at six months, they were still remembering that if I get a cough, I'm meant to go and see my doctor um, rather than just letting it linger. OK, well, this is very interesting. Um, you know, we do the first one. Well, it's going to last five to seven days. And now we're saying, actually, uh, there are some people we really want to see if they start coughing um, for a bit longer. Um, and it's important they come and see us. So it's just an interesting phenomenon that you can impact how your patients behave. So there are two levels of this study. One is, OK, for lung cancer, I might want to put in an educational program if I had the energy and the effort, but I might want to see more studies. But the second part is, education seems to work in practice, that you as family physicians have enormous authority and that if you say things and you deliver it as a proper message um, bundled with maybe other materials, you, you have an impact. And you can think about doing that with things that really are important to your localities and your practices. That's it. So, Martin, do you think um, that this is enough evidence, this small study with 200 people, to actually say that maybe uh, not talking to people not about stopping smoking, but about what you should notice if you're starting to get a cancer and what you should do about coming for diagnosis is, uh, is a, a, a change that we should have in our practices? No. I think 200 patients is too small to start changing my practice, but it's more evidence about education and the opportunities. And maybe it's about other, act, other things that you're seeing patients not doing that you think they ought to be doing that you could start to do an educational program for. Great. Uh, so this next research question was really looking about uh, can we find uh, COPD better than we're doing right now? Um, and so they, they worked on the premise that COPD is actually common and that often people aren't coming in to get treatment um, or uh, to be able to understand that this is why they're having a, a constellation of symptoms. Um, and this was practice-based, so they actually looked at everybody over 40 coming into a large number of practices to see uh, if they could screen for and then detect COPD very, very relatively easily. So they wanted to find a method that wasn't going to impact their practice times. They took three equal groups by randomization, and each practice was randomized to one of these arms. So everybody who came into that practice over the study period who was over 40 years of age uh, was enrolled in, um, was offered to be enrolled in uh, the study. And one group of the practices were randomized to receive the standard COPD uh, uh, population screening questionnaire. You can pick it up on the internet if you uh, uh, Google COPD-PS. And um, it's a really simple six questions that helps to look for COPD. Um, as well, that first arm, any of those practices, if the people were positive on their screening questionnaire, they took a fast little spirometry test. Um, the second arm got just the questionnaire, and the third arm got nothing at all. Uh, so they just enrolled all of these people coming into those practices in the third arm to follow what happened with them. And what they were following is whether they got a new COPD COPD diagnosis, whether they were sent on to specialist care, um, and uh, what their evaluations happened uh, for those patients. And what they found is that actually either by doing the questionnaire alone or doing the questionnaire and the spirometry, they found uh, um, significantly more patients, about 2.2, 2.3 times as many patients in either of those screening groups than they did usually. Now, their overall rates were low, much lower than we see actually in BC. We see more like 4% uh, among people that uh, um, are seeing our practices and maybe 13% overall if we actually actually add in spirometry and target smokers. Um, but uh, still, you can see that they doubled or more than doubled their pickup of COPD, and again, at a stage when uh, interventions could be made that may make a difference, which I think is what I said there. So do you think you have put into practice um, giving patients who maybe smoke in the waiting room the COPD questionnaire? I would think this, these simple six questions were something they can sit and do, and then, um, uh, and you can refer your patients to it on the internet too. It says, see your provider if you've got three questions or more positive. Uh, so very simple rating, very simple uptake, doesn't take any of your time. There, with 8,000 patients, I think there's enough to say that this yeah. is actually a reasonable intervention. And if you had a student or a resident, why don't you just give it to them? <laughs> they can do it as a project, you know, as a simple slam dunk, and you've done it. Um, so, cancer, uh, colorectal cancer screening. Um, 
Uh, I put my hand up. Um, my practice, um, I'm at about 28% uh, at the moment um, of patients over 50 who have documented, and that's my problem, um, documented colorectal cancer screening, either with a fit test or a, a colonoscopy. Um, so I know I'm not documenting, right? Um, well, maybe not. Maybe it's the true level. Because uh, this study, looking at uh, 16 practices, decided to uh, look at patients. They went for between 52 and 79, which is slightly odd age group, but whatever. Uh, usual care, chart reminder. That's what I thought would work. If I had a pop-up in my chart that said, do the colorectal cancer screening, chart reminder and mailed education and a fit test. Um, and then chart remainder, mailed education, fit, and a telephone call from an MOA or someone like that. So you have four arms to the study. And here are the results. Um, basically, what we're looking at is any CRTC test completed, so the, the top level. And you can see usual care, it's about 18%. Um, so I'm doing better than the usual care there. Um, I have to say that when I first started my audits, um, I was at 15%. Um, so I've gone past that, but only because I'm making an effort. Chart reminder, didn't work. That really quite surprised me. The fact that, you know, in, in electronic medical records or paper records that, you know, a tag just didn't, didn't well, I actually, and then I thought about it, well, yeah, it, actually, the patient's coming in for something totally different. I've got six patients coming in in this hour. I've got to get through because I need to get wherever, um, and it just slips. Sending it by mail to patients um, really seems to be the best thing to do. 56%. I would be really pleased if I had greater than 50% screening in my practice. Um, okay, I need to organize that. Um, and 57% if I have my MOA phone. So I, I don't think I'll do that, probably. Um, and that's the summary of it. <laughs> so do you think that's, again, enough to institute a change that we should all look at, at mailing these? And who's going to pay for us to mail these out to all our patients? Right. Well, that's what I've got a division for. Um, so I'm going to go to the division of, uh, in Vancouver and say, hey, guys, um, instead of paying for all that, why, why don't you support me mailing um, to my over 50s who don't have CRC um, screening documented on the EMR? Um, I, could, I could test how much it was going to cost, but it wouldn't be very much if I had an automated thing coming out of the electronic record. Um, and this stuff works. What about just having MOAs give them out at the reception desk? I think the problem is then you're just capturing the people who, we'll come anyway. yeah, and so you're a 55 year old male who's playing golf and doesn't come very much. You miss. Uh, good. So you've hung in there. You've been here for two days. It's Sunday afternoon. You need to get home. This is really our last. Uh, the studies we're going to bring for you today, and we'd be happy to answer questions afterwards. Uh, so this is really looking again at strep throat, and I know you've heard so often what should we be doing to be able to screen for strep throat, when should we give antibiotics. So uh, this is a British group that we're looking at, okay, what's the best way? Do we use a clinical score? Um, because sore throat is common, and the need for antibiotics is not common. Um, so they're adapting a randomized controlled trial. These trials have actually been done in many countries before, and they all find a around the same sorts of results, but I think they had a really good group here, a well-designed trial. This was um, uh, 17,600 patients, all non uh, older than five years old, and they administered uh, by randomization either just the clinical score or using the rapid antigen detection test after, uh, informed by what the clinical score uh, was, so only using the test if it was a clinical score of three or higher, um, and then just having a group where there'd be empirical delayed antibiotics uh, uh, with the doctor's judgment, which was their controlled group. Um, and so what they really found was that when they checked severity of, score, of sore throats through all of the groups, um, the, uh, they did have a little bit of unevenness despite the randomization. The severity was a, a little bit less in their clinical score group. Um, uh, but the um, symptoms um, were resolving faster in that group. Uh, maybe not so surprising when the severity is less, um, they found that about half the people in the empiric group ended up using those delayed antibiotics that they'd been given. Um, uh, but there were 30% less 
use of antibiotics when you were asking people to use them just by the clinical scores. And um, almost as good results were used if you had the clinical score and used that then to do a rapid agent detection test um, uh, to see if you had uh, the um, quick test for whether there was strep throat. Uh, interestingly, in this study, they didn't uh, use a control of um, uh, cultures, yep. which uh, uh, Waddell, one of our uh, people from the earlier studies, had done uh, out of his Toronto-based uh, group earlier. Um, and it really just showed that you can um, use the results of the rapid test uh, almost as well as the cultures. Uh, so, they, uh, essentially, it's found what I hope you probably are incorporating in your practices so far, that incorporating antibiotics using the clinical score does improve the symptoms faster and reduces the antibiotic usage. Um, and you can add the um, uh, rapid test as well, but it's not going to give you a lot extra benefit of just using the clinical scores. And again, these are available uh, on the internet. You can find them. So what do you think about not testing for strep and not treating strep? Well, we're always nervous about that, aren't we? Um, the fortunate thing is, over the last 20 years, in um, uh, developed countries, we have very, very low rates of people going on to any kind of pathophysiology after a sore throat. Um, so I think that um, uh, looking, particularly, we've heard now two or three of these studies, and we've heard from some of the other um, speakers yesterday, that antibiotic resistance is becoming a really important increasing problem in our society. And here's a way where you've got a very common disease, very rarely requiring antibiotics, um, where we could be able to use decision-making tools to decide on how to judiciously treat things. And if you don't manage to get to the conference, um, we'll try and bring back the pearls or nuggets next year. There we go. I'd yep. love to do that. Or you can come to FMF in the fall, which is here in Vancouver. <laughs> Thank you both.